Welcome to Real Rover. I'm your roving host, John Craig. Real Rover へようこそ。Craig John でございます。Introducing you to people you would never have heard of if it wasn't for Real Rover. Here we go. Our guest today on Real Rover is Paul Bridger. Now, Paul has been、uh, in my life since、mm, back in 1999, I, I believe. And I have been following his path since then. I've been following his activities, his studies, his incredible way of lending support to people and to. Communities. He's a great example of a healer and an educator. So let's meet Paul. We are beginning our talk, and so I'm, I'm very、uh, privileged to be sharing time with Paul Bridger today, who is in Calgary, I believe. Uh, I'm in North Saanich on Vancouver Island.、Uh, I've known Paul for many years, but we haven't been in contact、uh, for many years. It was only recently that we reconnected, and I understood、uh, what it was you were doing, Paul, if I may just bring this up,、mm -hmm. which is you're responsible for intentional directions, subtitled. Awaken, awaken significance within, and it's very clearly written here what you are most involved in, which is helping seekers make meaning of extraordinary experiences with the sacred,、uh, which is something that right now. I believe that we need to be considering with a lot more seriousness.、Mm. But right off the bat, experiences with the sacred can mean a plethora of things. What does it mean to you? Thanks, Ehan.、Um, for me, the, the sacred could mean different things for different people.、Um, but mostly what I'm referring to. Is when people have what is often called in the literature over the past hundred years or so a mystical experience, where there's an encounter with life, often an embodied encounter, though sometimes people it happens only in their consciousness and it's not something they're physically seeing or perceiving. Some of these things might include a, a near death experience, it might include birth. It might include、uh, an illness, right? It might include, and this is where my work tends to focus, it might include participation in a plant medicine ceremony. And in that, in that way of using the plant medicines to alter our consciousness so that we might perceive the sacredness of life more clearly. So, then the role I'm, I'm offering into the community is to support people before and after those kinds of experiences. Understood.、Uh, there's a great deal of chatter、uh, on the internet about what people think are sacred experiences. Which in many cases can simply be for them brought up in a, in a modern technological, economic, political milieu, which does not accept, understand,、uh, and certainly doesn't condone people having experiences of the sacred. 
uh, and plant medicines are very often reduced to a quick means to a quick end, which is some kind of sacred experience, one would hope. But your emphasis seems to be, since you are multifaceted, and the word coach doesn't really doesn't really come close to what you're doing. Your name suggests it, Bridger. You literally are bridging uh, the modern Western political economic model that you were born into in Canada with the indigenous traditions that you've been so enmeshed with for so long. So let's just go there. How did this connection with an entirely different stream of consciousness, which is the indigenous worldview, how did that happen to you and when? I love it. By accident, I would say. Uh, or maybe by design. I grew up in the suburbs of Vancouver, a small community called Surrey in British Columbia, Canada. And like you say, I grew up in that Western kind of dominant mindset. Right? I grew up in privilege. I grew up in a middle class family. You know, I never wanted for anything. I always had food and shelter and went to school and learned things and, and, and was just humming along in the system. You know, the matrix was working. <laughs> and, uh, and then in 1998, when I was just 26 years old, I had a diagnosis of a, a kidney disease that is a genetic disease traveling in my family. My father had the same disease. It seems maybe his mother did as well. And that diagnosis uh, prompted me to seek alternative methods of healing because I knew watching my father grapple with this illness, it's called polycystic kidney disease. I knew watching him that there is no cure. There's no, the only treatment is dialysis and transplant. And so I knew that was all the West had to offer me. Allopathic medicine had to offer me. And so even at that young age, I said, I need to find something else. There must be something else, right? I wasn't really raised in a religious belief system, but I had this faith within me that there must be another way, another option. And I had already kind of gravitated more towards natural healing in the sense of I was all about exercise and good diet and vitamins and minerals and, you know, like stay healthy sort of idea, right? Stay healthy naturally. So shortly thereafter, I was invited to my first sweat lodge, which was a very confusing experience for me. It was unlike anything I'd ever felt or seen or heard before, um, but it opened something in me. And then within the year, so this would have been 1999, I heard rumor, I heard rumor in the community I was living in, in Nelson, BC, that a man was there traveling with medicine from South America. And that caught my attention. I'm not, I can't really explain why, but it caught my attention to be, maybe that, maybe that would help. And so in, in meeting with him and, and beginning that first experience with the Piroa tradition of using Yopo and the medicines that go with it, something began to take a hold of me. And it was a growing awareness that there were other knowledge systems in the world Right? It wasn't at that point, it was specific to Southern Venezuela and the Piroa, but that I became aware that there were other knowledge systems in the world that had not been extinguished by colonization. And so that realization and that openness turned my attention toward, well, where do I live? 
whose territory do I live in? What practices and ceremonies are still alive here? And so, so in, in my turning my attention toward that began a path of exploration and meeting and encountering so many generous elders and teachers who, although I come dressed as a descendant of Europeans, um, perhaps an embodiment, you know, as a male cisgendered person, perhaps an, even an embodiment of the oppressor, and the so many people time after time would open their open their hearts to me open their fireplace to me show me things tell me things listen to me and how confused i was coming from my upbringing and culture about healing and how do i do this and how do i help myself but also how does that help my children how do i how do i help my community so that's really how it began. Surrey brings an image of very pampered lifestyle, typical liberal Canadian background. You can get anything you want. You can be anybody you want to be. Um, that's kind of magnified in the, in the succeeding decades into a let's just call it for lack of a better word, a totally me culture, mm. which is based on a paradigm that you just described, which will diagnose you as having such and such a disease that there isn't really a way to help. Um, but there is, and you found that doorway out of necessity, you found that doorway and you began a relationship, let's say, first of all, with a plant coming from an entirely different uh, worldview. You began a relationship with a plant. Now, saying something like that, I had a, I began a relationship with a plant, right? Mm -hmm. Well, back then I started a relationship with a plant, mm -hmm. but we really need to communicate here what that actually involves mm -hmm. what is a relationship with a plant and how did that begin to work in your system mm -hmm. where did that take you so let's just talk for a minute about your knowledge of that particular plant that came along as the first part of this bridge which you call yopo what's the correct term for it in that tradition yeah in their own language they would say yopo or yohua and the uh, the Latin name given for at least the seed, uh, one of the ingredients in this medicine is Anadenanthra peregrina. Mm. So it's a, it's a tree. But, I, but I'll back up just a little bit and say that it's a, the medicine practice from the Piroa, they use a suite of plants. So it's not a single plant. Mm. They use they use a suite of plants, much like in other traditions, um, a brew often known as ayahuasca is a combination of plants that are cooked together into a beverage or a tea. The way the Piroa use their medicine, they're still combining plants to prepare their medicine. Um, and some of the same plants that are used in ayahuasca, some of those same plants are used in this ceremony as well. And one of which is the seed of the Anadenanthra peregrina. And, you know, chemists look at it like, like the power that's in that plant is the NNDMT and the 5-MeO-DMT that both are present in that plant. So, so that's a very powerful visionary, um, a visionary chemical, right? That's that's within these plants. But it's just one part of what's in there, right? It's just one part of it. And how do you so, take this? How do you take the plant, Paul? Uh, so the way that Piroa use these plants is first they 
there's tobacco present. So they use a, um, they usually roll it into a kind of cigar and they refer to it as hate. And so they roll this tobacco like that and that's used and the smoke is used to kind of create that, that, that environment around for this work to happen. And then after the hate, they'll use what they call tuipai. And this is something I can I can send you written down so you can help with the translation. So in their language, they call it tuipai, uh, also known as Banisteriopsis kapi, or ayahuasca, or it, it goes by many names depending on the tradition, right? And and that you they harvest the the root bark, and then they chew that directly. They just eat the bark straight. Mm -hmm. And then after that's given some time, usually 20 to 30 minutes to begin to take effect over the, mostly over the digestive system, it turns off a kind of the monoamine oxidase inhibition in our guts, right? It turns that off so that whatever medicine's coming in next has full access across the blood brain barrier. Then the next medicine that they, provide is that mixture of plants that have been ground together in a mortar and pestle and made into a paste that then is is cooked by the fire so that paste is it's a raw paste and made into a patty and then cooked by the fire then that patty could be broken into small pieces and those pieces could be ground into a very fine powder and then inhaled. So the mm -hmm. powder is inhaled directly up into the nasal cavity. Yeah, so that's how the combination of those plants is administered. You experienced this presumably uh, after your first experience in Canada. I believe you went to visit these people and to hold ceremony with them, is that correct? I have, yeah. I visited a couple of times I went back to the community to, to learn and is that community presently active with its ceremonial work its healing work uh how much recognition does it have in the community now which is of course uh, a different paradigm it's a, it, it must be everywhere in south america is has been colonized so how are they surviving how are they doing mm, i appreciate you asking that question because uh, my own experience in visiting teachers like that has really deepened my own awareness of my privilege to be born and raised in this part of the world and to be able to access these kinds of ceremonies and knowledge. Uh, because my teachers there, it's a struggle there, to be honest. The way colonization plays out in Canada uh, over these past few hundred years is quite different than how it's played out in Venezuela. Uh, I, I mean, even days ago, I heard about a, a young Piroa leader, uh, um, someone who's defending their territory, right? Who was assassinated, right? And that's just that, that's just that political activism of like, this is our ancestral territory. You can't just come in and take whatever you want and log it, right? And so leaders like that are persecuted in that area. And then my, my teachers, um, the first teachers I worked with there, they have crossed over now, right? They've already, they died. The last one died, Bolivar died in, in six, six, almost seven years ago now. And at that time when I was visiting with him there, it was very clear that they struggle to continue that practice, mostly because of uh, colonial imposition, in particular from a group called the New Tribes Missions. And so there's this ongoing, even, even in today's age, this ongoing persecution of people who practice their ancestral medicine and healing as though it is some kind of devil devilry right that it's somehow 
um, connected with Satanism. And so for practitioners to be able to continue their work, right, the way their families have always taken care of their own health, the health of their children, the health of their territory, um, the health of the animals and plants within their territory, which is what they live from, that is threatened. It's totally global. Um, mm -hmm. Every indigenous culture it seems to be going through the, the same challenges. And it seems to me, I know that Canada is often lauded as, as a country which has done a lot to admit the mistakes, let's say, of, of colonization. Uh, even in my area here in North Saanich, uh, the local mountain, which is called originally Mount Newton, has now been returned to its original Aboriginal name, which unfortunately I can't pronounce, a local park too. Uh, these are these are like band-aid things I'm looking at here. All right, we, we recognize that it's actually you, you people's land. But, but then when it comes to having a traditional ceremony that go, goes back millennia, you can't do it. It's illegal. These substances mm. are illegal. Uh, this doesn't meet the requirements of, of modern psychoanalytical methodology. It, it's outdated. There isn't enough scientific evidence, etc., etc. Now, I, I know that you studied anthropology. Was, mm. was part of your desire to go into anthropology to further bridge that massive chasm that I've just described? I wasn't thinking about it like that at the time. Uh, the reason I found my way into anthropology and eventually specialized in medical anthropology was because I began, I was already working with the medicines and working with these, these teachers who traveled and shared these medicines with me. Um, I, and I and I entered into indigenous territories where I just happened to be the white fly on the wall, right? <laughs> who was witnessing, who was witnessing elders and leaders and medicine people from different cultures, some from from what's now called Canada, some from what's now called Venezuela, meeting and sharing songs and knowledge and medicine with one another. And I just happened to just be along for the ride in a way, right? But it showed me something old. It showed me these ancient patterns of indigenous collaboration and, and solidarity in how these knowledge systems have always persisted regardless of these 500 some odd years of at least European colonization in this part of the world. Um, so somehow catching a glimpse of that uh, led me to be like, well, how, how do so now I'm a white person witnessing something I think is really important to be happening in the world. So now what's my role? Am I just the chauffeur? Am I just the philanthropist, the funder that helps make these connections happen? Right? Is that all my role is? So so what I did is I began to turn my attention towards psychology. I was like, well, this might, I know it has something to do with healing. It has something to do with healing our minds and how we perceive and understand things. So I began that way. And after two years of studying psychology and kind of everything, I loved the developmental psychology. I loved a lot of that work. But then we started getting into um, abnormal psychology. And everything started turning towards the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, right? And I was, I started to just be perplexed of like, really, we're working backwards from what medications do things to people, and now we're didn't make sense to me. 
So I began to, to explore, well, what is this field of anthropology? People who for a hundred years, the initial anthropologists, of course, weren't trained in anthropology. They were trained in other things, biology and other kinds of studies who went and spent time among peoples in other parts of the world, right? Other cultures than their own, right? So that fascinated me more. I was like, this notion of cultures meeting one another, that's what gripped me. And I was like, so how do I become a useful instrument for that to continue, mm -hmm. right? And so that has continued to lead me um, into here. I live in what's called Calgary now, but among the Blackfoot, they call Mokinsists. Uh, it's the elbow. It's the meeting of two rivers here. And that falls in Treaty 7. And this is um, Blackfoot Confederacy territory. Right? There, are, there are numerous nations who, before treaty was even signed, created this place for themselves. The Sutina, the Stony Nakoda, there's a, three different Blackfoot groups. They all speak different dialects of the same language. So in living in this territory, I, it became very clear, well, that's who I need to connect with. That's just part of the work. So as I study anthropology, I learn about cultural methods of healing, how it is in different parts of the world, whether that's Polynesia or South America or India or wherever wherever anthropology is teaching us about, you know, I'm living it on the ground by finding my way into the local community to offer help, like literally show up and offer to chop wood and carry water, right? Mm -hmm. The ancient, ancient mm -hmm. way of being helpful. Mm -hmm. However, the fact that you chose anthropology, I think was significant. Uh, because to be an effective bridger, you have to have weight in both traditions. You have to have the respect that you have obviously gained by chopping wood and carrying water, by helping, by entering their world and showing that you're not only interested, you're, you're willing, you're ready. And in this culture here, having conversations like this and doing what you have been doing as a coach which is not really a very good term for what you do i agree but you've got two traditions here that you are very familiar with and i'm imagining that you want to have more of an impact as a bridge and right off the top of your head what kind of impact and with given the remainder of your life we're talking mm -hmm. about your vision now what could you hope to achieve given the depths that colonization has gone to to eradicate these very, very many different cultures? What would you assume you could do? So I see myself at a confluence of traditions. I don't know if it's at a confluence of traditions or as a confluence of traditions. I'm, I'm informed by many and by many experiences with people who speak very different languages from one another and have very different worldviews and ways of being, you know. Um, it wouldn't be fair of me to paint all my teachers with one or two brushes, right? Each is coming from such a unique tradition, uh, which is beautiful. And, and I feel so grateful to coming from where I've come from, from where my family's come from, to have encountered that mm -hmm. and, and to be welcomed, to be made to feel like I belong there as a helper. So my vision that's been developing over the years is about creating more opportunities for those traditional indigenous 
knowledge keepers or elders or healers or however we see them to come together. There's so many different ways that that can happen, but it's it just feels like it's inherent in my name, you know, and, and I can do that in a lot of different areas of my life, but this idea of bridging, and for me, it's about bridging culture, and I may be a beneficiary of that for sure, right? And I'm so grateful for what I learn along the way, but what's most important for me is that these leaders, these healers, leaders from their communities have these opportunities to come together in physical space, in ceremony, on the land to listen to one another, right? To share their concerns about what's happening in their family and in their communities, um, how each government is dealing with their people, right? the way that oppression is continuing so that there can be solidarity continuing to be generated how they share their their knowledge their songs their dances their medicines with one another that's the the big vision i have in my own life is to consciously pay up play a part of that unfolding more mm. Well, that's very clear. Uh, you're aware of the immense difficulties of, of such an undertaking. <laughs> immense difficulties. Uh, but if you're, if you're going to exert yourself using your capability as a bridger, then uh, that would be the natural direction of your efforts to do the very best you can to bring, and that's an important point you brought up. This is not one or two traditions. These are hundreds uh, and, and around the world. We're talking about many thousands of different cultures with different languages and different practices. Uh, however, they all share, it seems to me from my limited understanding, it seems to me that they all share the idea of medicine. Mm. Every single one of them has a concept of medicine that is entirely different from what the word means to us now in English. So could you share what you uh, understand now as medicine? That idea of medicine has changed for me over the years because as a youngster of course uh, my parents giving me antibiotics was probably or, or and other kind of home remedies little remedies around the house that was probably my first experience with the idea of medicine here take the medicine it's bitter even a Mary Poppins, right? Take a little sugar to medicine, go down, right? This whole notion that came from my upbringing, right? This medicine doesn't taste good, but it'll help you. You'll feel better, right? Um, and so I was brought up that way and always relayed, related medicine to uh, the healthcare system which in Canada is a, is a free system, right? You just, you're, you're signed up and you're, you're a member of it and you receive it, right? You go to the hospital and you don't get a bill, right? Um, you have to pay for medications, right? But, and so for me, it was like that until my late teens, early twenties, when that's probably the beginning of me becoming aware of herbal medicine, right? That one might take uh, herbs or decoctions of plants rather than a pharmaceutical. And for whatever reason, however I was wired, that appealed to me more as a youngster. You know, I was in my teens and early 20s. It was like, no, that's that's more that aligns with who I am more. It's a plant It comes from the earth. 
I will prefer natural, right? Mm -hmm. And so early in that, early after that diagnosis, I began, that's one of the things I began to explore, you know, even before finding my way into that sweat lodge was Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, Western herbalism, where I started to understand plants as medicine. Once I began to use those uh, sacred plants from South America, right, the ones that alter our consciousness, I began to understand medicine differently, right? Because I started to see, oh, well, there's, you know, there's drinking coffee, which is a plant, and it has this kind of effect on me. I get very excited and talkative. Or there's drinking chamomile tea, which is a mild sedative and helps me relax. I started to understand plants that way. Mm. But now that I started to experience these plants that alter my consciousness, my understanding of medicine changed. It was something more than just physiological, which I think is what my early understanding was. Is like you take that and physiologically your symptoms will go away and you'll feel better. What started to happen with these other plants and then happened as I moved into uh, other kinds of indigenous ceremonies that don't use those strong plants was an awareness of consciousness itself and prayer as medicine. So that really changed for me. And then by participating in ceremonies like the sweat lodge and like sun dancing, I began to recognize how consciousness and prayer could be embodied in that we could perform prayer. We could perform that degree of conscious expansion with our bodies. We can do it in a sweat lodge. We can do it sun dancing. There's so many ways. Those are just two examples. So the notion of what is medicine changed yet again. And now I might summarize, I, I wasn't expecting this question, but I might summarize it with our way of life is our medicine. I'm glad I asked the question. Yeah. Uh, because uh, it's, it's fundamental to indigenous healing systems, knowledge, wisdom around the world, that there is some kind of medicine that doesn't necessarily involve plants because there are parts of the world where a uh, shamanic ceremony, for example, is carried out through drumming or dancing. And like you say, uh, with a sweat lodge or vision quests. Yeah, uh, in this well, territory, well, in this yeah. territory, it would be common, like a, the most common access I'd say would be fasting. Yeah. Be fasting. Just go without food and water and you will experience medicine. You will definitely experience medicine. I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, um, this is an important uh, distinction you made as your understanding of medicine expanded mm -hmm. uh, to include prayer, to include way of life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's important now because, of course, we're in the age of uh, capitalizing on indigenous healing in mm -hmm. a big way. Uh, some can be summarized as ayahuasca tourism. So, so the idea is uh, you can relocate your body to a different physical location in Costa Rica or Peru or wherever, mm -hmm. and there will be a shaman there, and it's okay, he's going to be fine, right? And you're going to drink this, and uh, you've read all the spirit molecule stuff already, and you know about how DMT affects consciousness. So you're ready and primed to go in there and get your experience, and then you're going to lift off and come back with your experience, and suddenly you're going to be a more sacred person. <laughs> this is a classical example of what's happened around the planet with all indigenous wisdom, all of it. Uh, there's a capitalization uh, on it. And you know, I can give you a simple example. Um, I I worked with uh, with Humbats in, in the Yucatan, who was a was a traditional uh, solar priest. 
uh, one whose medicine was was connecting to the sun and, and praying to the sun. Uh, and, and the so-called Mayan calendar came along later, uh, much publicized by a very uh, artistic, knowledgeable, and uh, high level of communicative power individual by the name of Jose Arguez. Mm -hmm. and, and Jose Arguez, Dr. Jose Arguez, uh, had a phenomenal impact on the world through the idea of a new calendar that was based on, on the Mayan system. Now, uh, they were not in agreement, these two individuals, even though the elder from the Yucatan had been the tutor to the younger white man, who mm -hmm. later become, became world famous because he was a white man. <laughs> Simply because of that, because of his privileged connections, mm -hmm. uh, education, and everything else, and the humble uh, Humbats Mens uh, was, in a sense, reduced to a tourist guide, taking people around, showing them a different understanding of this calendrical system, which did connect to medicine, to way of life, and all the rest of it. So, what I'm getting to here is that you've made the important uh, point that it's the prayer of the community, the entire operation of the community, which happens to be using a plant that is actually very instrumental in any resulting change of consciousness. It's all together as one. And this is why there are now all kinds of problems appearing with ayahuasca tourism. Uh, young women getting raped by, by uh, horny shamans, right, for example case after case is coming to light now taking advantage of these women's vulnerability for example more and more common people not being able to reintegrate this experience of the so-called sacred that they had for three days before they came back on the plane it's a it's a huge problem uh, which is which is part of i feel which is part of the work of of bridging is to share with people it's not just the chemical action it's not just the plant it's a lot more than that now how have you addressed that in your own work paul you you're obviously aware of it how have you addressed this which i got to me could i just ask you to there's lots of me to speak there about what how have i addressed what exactly how have you addressed the uh, perception of healing plants that doesn't include the culture, the ceremony, the wisdom tradition, but tends to focus on its chemical ability, its neurochemical ability to affect consciousness. So you don't really need a shaman. You don't really need the traditions because it's all about brain chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you address that when you have people who are willing and open and able and really want to get a sacred experience, but they want to encapsulate it in three or four days, which is ayahuasca tourism, right? Mm -hmm. There's another huge bridge that we have, we have to deal with. Is there any advice you can give them? I appreciate you bringing this up because uh, I have to constantly regulate that awareness in myself and one of the ways i do that is remaining connected to these lineages i find myself at the confluence of in the sense of how would my elders uh, respond to to my behavior right the the kind of built-in accountability that as human beings we used to always have in the village setting right we if we misbehaved we would have been corrected quickly right no not like that like this right and so i don't live in the same place as a lot of my teachers though many live here not all right so i can't be corrected all the time so I have to learn how to self-correct as I go. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes as I do that. I'm sure. Do I hope that people will respectfully approach me and teach me and correct me? Yes. Am I, am I prepared for other forms of, of correction? 
call it persecution or trolling or whatever, whatever people want to call it. Yes. Right. It's a big community we live in now. To me, it seems that this issue really comes down to, I could summarize it with just two words, relationship and reciprocity. So, and this comes back to one of the questions you asked earlier, right? How do you get into a relationship with a plant? What does that even mean? What does it mean to be in relationship with something that's not human, right? Not even animal, right? It's not like even, even that closely related to us, <laughs> you know? What does that mean to become or to deepen into relationship with the water source in the area that you live in? What's that relationship, right? Who knows where the water that comes out of their tap comes from, right? So these are relationships that I think we're always responsible for becoming aware of and then tending or taking care of. So one of those when elders trust you enough to teach you something or to share medicine with you, you have a responsibility to that relationship. Right. And of course, culturally, we 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 come from different backgrounds and we might think of respect differently. Maybe, you know, that's a possibility I'll put out there. But it seems to me that we're able to learn about respectful conduct interculturally. Right. As we learn to work with people who don't speak the same language as us, don't eat the same food as us, don't think the same way about life as us. There's still a way to create reciprocal relationship with, with people. And by reciprocity, I don't mean uh, you just paid for your retreat. And so, you so you know, you've paid for it. So we're good. Not yeah. like that. But more like, more like how I've seen um, exemplified or demonstrated by my teachers, which is that they take responsibility for caring for their their teachers and their teachers families for multiple generations mm -hmm. to come. so it's not just a buy and sell sort of arrangement it's more of a it's more of a how do i ensure that my teachers grandchildren will be taken care of that's a different way of approaching these things right even the example of like, I need to make sure that I learn this song correctly or properly or the best way possible. Because if my teacher's grandchild returns to me some years later and says, you spent time with my, with my grandma, what was that song she sang? I don't remember it. My parents don't remember it. That's my responsibility, right? So it's the same way with a song like that as it would be with any kind of knowledge that traditional knowledge keepers share with us. It's a, it's a responsibility. Could we go out and abuse that and, and make a ton of money and become millionaires and whatever? I, I haven't seen a lot of examples of that. I've certainly seen people mess it up. Um, possibly. Possibly people could do that. Um, I see there's a different way and I'm so glad that I've had the mentorship to show me something else so that whenever I get to impart what was told to me, right, what I was taught, I can do so with a, would you like to support our teachers families, right? How do I, how do I do this work to help both myself, my family, my clients, their families, and our teachers' families and lineages benefit from everything we're doing? How do I do that? That to me is a different kind of awareness or consciousness. And I think that that kind of reciprocity, that kind of relationship focus, would change the conversation. Mm. I also think part of my responsibility 
is to protect my elders and teachers. And so sometimes the way I protect them is not really telling people where they are or how to get mm. them, right? But rather, but rather waiting because people, we show ourselves, we show ourselves quickly to one another, right? If we're willing to notice, if we're willing to see, people show who they are. So, so the slower I make a process for people, right? It's like, I end up acting like a bit of a gatekeeper, right? It's like, I, I, I'll offer the teachings my elders have given me. And those are enough for people to change their lives. They don't need to get to the elder right away. It's my job to protect that elder from clowns coming in who might want to abuse them, right? Now, over the years, I can see people who have a good heart and are genuine and want to really contribute to this vision of my teacher's families surviving. That's how I look at it. It's my job, having been taught, to learn how to ensure their survival into the future. Got that. Very clear. Very important point you made, Paul, because uh, wasn't that always the way it was here on Earth through, through all of our evolution minus the last few hundred years where and when we suddenly got different ideas, for better or worse, in our heads about reality and the sacrifice that had to be made at the time was that the old ways had to be steamrolled into oblivion, basically, whether consciously or unconsciously, it's not important. It happened. Um, Wade Davis, in conversation, referred to this process as ethnocide. Mm -hmm. the, the absolute murder and, and, and uh, wiping out of indigenous knowledge, not just people and, mm -hmm. and histories, but knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, which when you consider it seriously, as, as, as any thinking individual should, um, it is a massive scar on our, on our history. It's a, it's a huge gaping wound. And, who knows how that came about? It's a great mystery, but it did. And the result is to get back to it, a tourism, which will give you the hit. Uh, you won't have any responsibility to the community or what happens to them. You can forget about them next week. You've had your sacred experience, which you can talk about in bars for the next 12 years. And everybody goes, wow, where did you go? What was the shaman's name? I want to go too. Uh, none of it entailing any responsibility whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you've mentioned something very important. It's it's not just your life, and that's going to continue, hopefully, through your own friends and associates and children mm -hmm. and family, that they have a relationship with a still existing community of people who understand the meaning of medicine. Mm -hmm. So now. Uh, you are actively involved in what? Tell us what you're doing now as part of this process that we've explained, hopefully to viewers. Just before I go there, Ehan, I just want, what was coming up for me as you summarized that was how we've, these last few hundred years, maybe longer, uh, the culture I come from, right, which is mostly Western European, um, have become distracted by competition and greed. And that's what wipes out, like Wade's talking about ethnocide, that's what feels threatened by difference. Um, so that's what stuck out for me at first there, this, this, Somehow we've been distracted or misled by competition and greed. It's about me. Our society has become very individualistic. So even as people pursue these experiences, this medicine, and it takes them into these faraway places and or even the shaman visits their house or however that is, right? 
it's it's still easy to get distracted by that you know so what i'm up to right now what i'm up to right now is some months into beginning my own private practice as an integration coach that's how i refer to myself i agree coaching is a, a strange way to call it but it works for now uh, and an integration coach meaning that i i offer community integration circles one is in person at a fire uh, that's once a month that's tonight and then one happens online and so people can get a hold of me through the website easily to be able to participate in those integration circles oh. and an integration circle to me is a a place where we gather to listen to one another for what's really going on in our lives maybe that's an integration from a plant medicine experience maybe it's an integration from um, a loved one who's just died maybe that's an integration from uh, waking from one of those dreams that just feels super significant to us um, maybe it was a car accident and we just about died there we left for a bit and then they revived us or I, I don't know what it is for people but i'm creating a safe yet courageous space for people to be able to express themselves about what it is they're going through mm. in their life right mm. and and i hold it in a kind of a circle format so that means everyone's going to be able to speak everyone's going to be able to listen um, often there's songs involved i love to sing when i've got people gathered so i do those kinds of things by donation in the community and then I also work with people one on one. And that's if someone feels like they just want more concentrated time. Mm. I want time with someone who has some experience with integrating their own spiritual plant medicine experiences, ceremonial experiences, whatever it is. Um, and who can who can listen to me well enough that they might reflect back to me what I'm saying, but also have the kind of courage to be able to ask me questions that help me really get to the meat of what I'm trying to understand in my life. So I do both of those things. Uh, there's a community work, a community level, and then there's also an individual level understood i think that we've covered some good initial ground today but it's certainly not the end uh <laughs> you've already inspired me to take part in at least the online oh, good. because uh that's obviously very important uh, as is the actual circle around a real fire um I would like to consider this an opening Great. for the discussion uh, because it's it's obviously important uh, right now. It's, it's obviously important. Uh, if I could paraphrase it, the entire world is going to hell in a basket. <laughs> it certainly appears that way. <laughs> it would seem to be the case. Right. And uh, we have now uh touching on anthropology we've now got evidence from a cave in israel uh of very advanced tool working techniques especially a whole variety of blades have been found to cut things of different thicknesses mm -hmm. for different reasons by individuals who they still can't say were homo sapiens but they certainly weren't homo erectus and they probably weren't neanderthals but they lived in a cave and they had very high capability of making tools and it seems that they were having experiences of medicine even then 400,000 years ago which has doubled the age of homo sapiens overnight so we're talking about a very very long story 
Mm. It seems to have, in the very last segment of it, gone completely and utterly out of its mind. Uh, that's how I would paraphrase modern Western technological society based on greed and competition, uh, mm. uh, as you correctly pointed out. I don't think any intelligent person can argue with that. It's greed and competition, <laughs> right? This is what you get after 100 years of greed and competition. Hello, mm. right? Sick people with very little spiritual awareness, uh, no real medicine in their lives, hanging mm. desperately psychologically and spiritually uh, at the end of a, of a rope over the edge of a cliff. That's where we are. And so people like yourself have an incredibly, uh, from my point of view, an incredibly important function. And I salute you and I celebrate you. And I look forward to the next discussion, which uh, will be when we're ready for it. I look forward to it. Yeah, if anything, I may be that person reaching down over the cliff and offering a hand. I think you are. Yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time out to invite me to this conversation, Ahan. Thank you so much. Just the beginning. Just the End beginning. broadcast, and we'll see you again, sir. Thank you.